Hey everyone, we're back online and with Jason Fried. I don't know if any of you uh, know Jason Fried. If you don't know Jason Fried yet, it's the co-founder and CEO of Basecamp, formerly known as 37 Signals. And he's also the co-author of the bestseller, uh, we, we Work and Remote, two books that are the first book to be written really about remote work officially. So it's an honor to have you today with us and be able to have a live interview with you. I will, um, well, I want to welcome you. Welcome, Jason, for uh, this live interview. Thanks for having me on. Really, really happy to have you. Um, I'm going to be asking you questions today about different parts of um, a base camp uh, related mostly to base camp operations. So we'll but really like cover different topics related to managing a business that is remote. So I like to go ahead. I have some questions written down. I'm kind of, I will be kind of go with the flow at the same time, but feel free if you feel uh, inspired to go ahead and tell us more about everything. So I'd like to first start with a question where, as we all know, you're very, uh, you're a big uh, a person who really advocates uh, remote work. You're very passionate about that topic. And I would like to know if you would go back in time and see you at the beginning of Basecamp, what advice would you give you as you know, as you in the past about working remotely? Well, I think the, the, the thing that's important really is to start doing this when you're a small, small business or right from the beginning. Because um, what happens is, is that if companies are, if they get big, like 20 or 30 or whatever, 40 or 50 or whatever people, and they try and hire their first remote employee, like it's really hard to get that to work. Um, but it's a lot easier to start from the beginning. So we, we did do that. But I've seen other companies stumble when they haven't started remote and they haven't built the culture up as a remote company from the start. It's very hard to switch in the middle. So I would remind myself that if I care about remote, um, that I would want to start that as soon as I possibly could. So everyone's used to it and we begin building up our own systems to understand how to work together remotely and that whole thing. So that, that was a, that's a very important thing. The other thing I would say is that when you work remotely, you, you are, as an employer, you're lucky because you get the pick of the world. You can hire the best people in the world, not just the best people within a 20 mile or 20 mile or 20 kilometer radius of your office, but you can actually hire the best people. So we have people working for us in 30 or 40 different cities around the world and a bunch of different countries. And it's, it's wonderful. Cool. Cool. Um, about this, actually, I, uh, you were talking about in the past, does it mean that you started and you were not uh, remote at the beginning? Because I heard that, uh, before 37 signal was a service company, right? So yeah, when we first started, we had um, four people and they were all in Chicago, but the fifth person who turned out eventually to be my business partner, David, um, he was the first remote person we'd ever hired. We'd ever worked with. And um, so, so I would say we did start pretty early from the beginning around five. Now that we have about 50 people, but the first few were not. And um, I think if we would have gone on too long with only hiring local people, it would have been extremely difficult at some point then to switch over and, and become a remote company. So that's tough. One, one, one thing I would suggest though, if people are at the point where they have 20 or 30 or whatever, and they want to begin to, to explore remote hiring, what they should do is first get used to working remotely with local people. So before you go off and hire your first remote person, um, like ask everyone to work from home two days a week. Mm -hmm. even though they're local and just start to get used to what it's like to not see everybody all the time. Um, and, 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 and start to, you know, perfect your systems around that before you hire your first far away remote employee. Right. I just want to remind us to everyone that you can ask questions in the Q and a uh, section. So we are still doing Q and a, um, part of this live interview. So I'm going to ask questions for the first 30 minutes, but in the end, we'll still have people and we'll still take your questions to ask Jason uh, in the end. Um, so I like to talk to you about communication, mainly because we have been talking to the, about this a lot, the whole way of the conference today. And, um, so communication is one of the biggest challenges of any remote team. Um, have you had any instances when, when miscommunication has caused a big storm in the company? Um, so yeah, by the way, I think companies don't have communication problems. They have miscommunication problems, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, um, there definitely have been, there was actually a situation last year when we were talking about, um, actually, let me, let me step back. It's funny because it, this was a small, tiny one liner thing 
in a long post and it ended up causing a lot of problems because yeah. um, this wasn't even a local or remote thing. It was just like a communication thing. And to me, in my it, generally, I think the communication is the same locally or remotely. You just have to be very clear uh, and provide context and make sure everyone understands what you're talking about. But we were beginning to look into um, making sure that we were paying everybody the right salary in terms of making sure we were at the top of the industry, which was a good and noble goal. We wanted to make sure that we were paying people really, really well. So we wrote up this thing uh, internally. Every, every day, Basecamp, at, Basecamp, the product, asked everybody in our company to write up what they worked on today. And, and one person wrote that they were, the person who was in charge of, of doing this salary sort of study wrote like salary study, like working on salary study. Now, no one else had heard about this salary study before. They didn't know what it meant. But the fact that someone mentioned that there was like a salary study going on kind of naturally freaked everyone else out. Like, what does this mean? Am I going to get a pay cut? Am I going to get like, what does this even mean? And we had to like really do some damage control around that. And it was a reminder that um, context is, is among the most important things when it comes to communication. That if you just say a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and don't provide the whole story, people will fill in the gaps themselves. And they'll typically fill in the gaps with, with negative things that they're worried about. And I don't blame people for doing this, we all do it, but it's what happens. So it's very important, I think, to make sure people have the whole story and the complete story around something and not just little tiny bits of information, which is one of the reasons why we don't chat very often in our company. I, I find chat tools to be, uh, basically major creators of communicate miscommunication problems. Hmm. So we write things up completely in long form and make sure that everyone has the whole story, not just one small line at a time. Okay. So can you maybe tell us why you prefer, so asynchronous communication for you is easier because it's one simple day at a time, but at the same time, there is also problems related to that. And you know, um, when it kind of block, you wait always for somebody to answer you there and make information. So how do you deal yeah. with, what are the problems you face as well with asynchronous sure. communication and how do you deal with that? Sure. I think, um, in my opinion, and I've been, we've been working remotely now for about 15 years and, um, um, we've seen a lot, we've, we've had a lot of experience here and, um, I think the only way to do it effectively where people can actually have a life outside of work is to communicate primarily asynchronously. The problem with real time communication with remote teams is time zones. You have, people who are all around the world or, or, or four or five hours apart or even three hours apart. And if my five o'clock ends and, but it's someone else's, you know, uh, if, if it's like eight o'clock my time, it might be four o'clock someone else's time. So if we're only able to communicate real time, you're basically pulling everyone into the conversation all day long. Mm -hmm. And it's a very difficult, it's actually a very disruptive and difficult thing for people to maintain a sense of work is over if everyone is expected to be available all the time in real time to have any, any conversation that someone else wants to have when they're four or five time zones apart. So we found that um, real time communication is very handy um, for things that don't really matter. So like social chatter, kind of goofing around, stuff that doesn't really matter if someone sees it or not, but anything that really needs to be communicated that you really need other people to see should be written down in an asynchronous way. We use Basecamp, you can use a variety, whatever you wanna use. But the point is, is that um, you have to remember that your five o'clock, maybe someone else's eight o'clock or nine o'clock or the next day or early in the morning. And so asynchronous is great. The downside of asynchronous is speed, but in my opinion, very few things really need to be dealt with immediately. Things that need to be dealt with immediately are things like a crisis, an emergency. Those things really do require immediate conversation and, and like right now, all hands on deck sort of stuff. But if that's happening all the time, you've got a major problem in your company to begin with. So I find that it's okay if you let people, if you write something up and someone gets back to you tomorrow. Like what's the rush? What are we always rushing for? So we're very much proponents of trying to keep the company calm and let people get back to you when they're ready to and not just when you want them to. It's a very different cultural approach to communication, but I find it's the only sustainable way. And we wanna be in business for 20, 25, 30 years. Like if you wanna be, you know, if you don't really care about being in business that long, like you can definitely burn everyone out mm -hmm. and make people work crazy hours and just make everything real time. But if you want a, a sustainable business where people are comfortable working for you for a long period of time, that, like real time all the time is not a method that's going to create a level of sanity in your organization.
So in your opinion, if you want to grow, if as, as, as much as you grow, the more you grow, the more conversation there is and the more like over information there they can be. Um, yes. So you think that asynchronous is better for that? And how do you, so the other, my other question about this is mostly about um, how to get notified about um, these communications. How does that work? Uh, is it like, are you, are you pinged by email? Because there's also the email overflow and you always get notifications from everything online. We don't how do send, you deal with this? We send zero emails in our company um, and we only chat about non-important things. Um, Everything else happens inside Basecamp. So Basecamp has its own notification, Basecamp 3. Basecamp has its own notif internal notification system. So you basically have a single inbox, and I'm happy to show you guys this, by the way. I can share my screen and show you this. You have a single inbox that contains all the different types of communication that you can send through Basecamp. And um, if you want to get emails, you can turn on email notifications. If you don't want emails, you turn off email notifications. You, mm -hmm. you go in and you can check the app whenever you want. You can get desktop notifications if you want. You can turn those off. So a lot of different ways to do it but we don't send emails because emails are not, so here's the thing, email is not asynchronous, it is asynchronous communication, but it has major flaws in that it's not shared and centralized. The secret to work, making asynchronous communication work is it needs to be centralized where everyone sees the exact same story. The problem is, is that email, if you send emails out, if you don't include someone on a reply all, someone might, might not see the whole story. No one has it. There's no one version of the story. The most mm -hmm. important thing I can get across to you guys today is that if you want to communicate in any way, everyone has to have the same version of the same complete story. The moment people have different versions in their inbox, it's over. It's, it's broken. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm happy to show you what we do, but if, if uh, if, if you want to see it, I can show you our actual Basecamp account and walk you through that. Um, the thing is, is that um, asynchronous is great because there's one history of the entire conversation. There's no other conversations being mixed up in between. This is the big downside of chat rooms, which is that you don't know when a conversation began. You don't know when a conversation ended. You don't know which topics are being covered. It's just a complete mess. And we're trying to like, people are trying to get used to this and think it's better. It's not better. It's better when it doesn't matter and you can just have social fun stuff, but it's not a great way to communicate, especially across time zones, um, because it lacks context and, and, and things get scattered. So um, one of the Absolutely. most important things is, is context, which is subjects and topics. So I can look at them and go, I know what this conversation is about. And then I can decide on my own time if it's worth answering or not. Yeah, I can totally relate. And just in, uh, in, my, in my company at Human Made, for example, I work in the Eastern time zone right now. And a lot of my team are in Europe right now. So wake right. up in the morning, it might be have like a few mentions in Slack. And then I want to make sure I didn't, you know, I got to see everything and then they answer everybody. But usually it always stays, you know, the, the, it's never like that many. If there was so many things to see, they would go asynchronously. But we still have this thing and it's true that when you get in you can be a bit like overflow by a lot of like different notifications about from different people well the other problem is the, this is this is so important it's, this stuff is so important because people people are causing themselves a lot of pain and they don't even realize it for example when you come into the morning you've got these app mentions right um if you go to the app mention and uh, and you look at what it said well where do you respond to that um you respond at the bottom of the chat now Right. Mm. And so now it's disconnected. It's no longer connected to the conversation. There is no way for anyone to come back to that conversation and see the whole conversation because other things have happened in the meantime. And, that, and it's, it's such a broken model. It's very popular right now, but it's very broken to work this way mm -hmm. because um, it, it, it makes it very difficult for anyone to know what is being discussed and where. And you can't come back to complete conversations. You have fragmented conversations. Fragmented conversations. Um, make everything more complicated for everybody. There's no like sort of what, what did we talk about about this topic? You just never know where it is. So it's, it's a difficult, it's, it's possible, but it's not the best way to do these things. And I think that, yeah, yeah. And it, you know, we, the, th the reason I'm mentioning this is because we, we, um, we've, been, we've been using chat longer than pretty much any company around. We, we, about 10 years ago, we, we made something called Campfire, which is sort of the first version of, of, of all these modern tools now. Um, and we've seen these problems compound over the years where you're just on a conveyor belt and conversations are, are mixed up and you just can't find anything later and you can't refer back to things. It's a very difficult thing. So 
the only reason I'm saying this is because we've had experience doing this and it, it doesn't work over the long term. It's very appealing in the short term, especially when you're switching from email. But over the long term, it breaks down very quickly and everyone feels very anxious. Mm. There's more anxiety at work today in companies that work that way than there was in the past. And I think that this is a fundamental problem. So anyway, we're going to be talking, I'm happy to talk more about this or, or we can. Yeah, actually Tom will talk about that afterwards, after your, after I just, uh, about stress and remote teams is actually really related to that. I like to jump on to something else, which is a topic I really like, um, about product because I work in product myself. Um, so when a team is together in a regular office space, so a regular team who works in the same office, um, they they can really have their own, um, they can really build a great energy and creativity together when they're bringing new ideas or they want to build new product. And this is something that can be a big challenge when you are a product team uh, spread across the globe. So I want to know um, what is the Basecamp creative process when you're building new product remotely? Sure. So um, we have a few stages uh, and, and sort of steps. Um, and the thing that we do uh, is, um, we have, we have small teams. So first of all, we have, we have uh, teams of three, basically. No more than three people work on anything, pretty much. Um, and so uh, every six weeks or so, we, we begin a new cycle of work. And a cycle of work has two different kinds of projects in it. You can have what we call big batch project, which is gonna take the full six weeks, or small batch projects, which take anywhere from a few days to, to maybe a week or so, or a week or two. Um, and to determine which, which projects go in which slot, um, we, we ask everybody in the company to write up pitches. So if somebody has an idea, and again, I'm happy to share my screen and show you these things if you want to see the actual pitches, but um, uh, we, um, we ask people for pitches. And a pitch is, here's a problem. Here's why I think this is a problem. And here's the solution. And they write it up in long form. It's fully documented. It can include screenshots. It can include sketches, but it's fully thought out. This is so, again, so important. There's so many people wasting so much time out there sharing fragments of ideas and partial ideas. The problem is, is that you can't do anything with that except kick off another conversation, which kicks off another conversation. We want people to come with fully formed, thoughtful ideas. Now they can have discussions amongst themselves about ideas. But when you actually share an idea with the rest of the company, it needs to be fully formed. So we write up these long pitches and we all discuss them and debate them internally. And then a, a team of three people, so me, David, and my business partner, and a, a guy named Ryan on our team, we go through all the pitches, look them over, and decide which, what things we're gonna be working on over the next six weeks. We then ask people who are gonna be working on these things, or the, team, the product team, like, what, which one of these projects in, interests you? What, what's interesting? Like, any of these interest you? Oh, yeah, I like this one, or I like this one, or I like this one. And we create teams around interest areas, and then those people are assigned to those projects for the next six weeks, and then we, we at the end of the six weeks, we take a two-week break mm -hmm. from scheduled project work, and people can kind of roam and freely work on whatever they want, and then we do another six-week cycle. So that's sort of how that works. But everything starts with a fully formed, thought out idea, which is then pitched to the rest of the company, which then everyone can, can look at and consider and, and think through. And I actually um, recently wrote up this process. I'll paste a URL cool. yeah. um, so you guys can, other people can, can read up on this later if, if they're interested. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's worked out really well for us. This is, again, like based on 10, 12 years of refining how we work. Um, and uh, here, I'll pop this in. Well, talking about that, the fact, you know, um, seems to have like small teams to, to talk, to work on different projects and everything. So how does Basecamp work actually in terms of organizational structure? So The company? Yeah. So I mean, there was Basecamp at the beginning and there was a structure, maybe a small structure at the beginning, but then as, more as you grow, how do you structure uh, the company? Yeah, sure. So um, the company set up, uh, of course, when it was small and there was like four or five or six people, there was no structure. It was just like, here we are together. Let's just work. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and it, as you get larger, um, you, you begin to layer in a little bit more structure. Um, and then at some points you actually remove some structure because you actually put in too much in the wrong place. And you kind of, it's, a, it's an ever evolving sort of, sort of thing. Right. Um, and um, uh Right now, I'll tell you, like, we're about 50 people. So there's me, I'm the CEO. We've got a CTO, David, who's my business partner. We're kind of like also sort of, we, we determine the direction of the company together. Um, we have um, 
design team, which is made up, these numbers are a little rough because some people are sort of one or they, they kind of wear a few different hats, but about seven or eight designers in the company, um, about 12, 13, 14 programmers in the company. Customer service team has 14 people. We have an ops team that runs all of our servers and, and infrastructure. There are about six or seven people. We have someone who runs our sort of our data, data analyst. So there's one person for that. We have an office manager. Um, and then we have a few other kind of roles that are sort of fluid, but basically the product team in total, designers and programmers, uh, is you know around 20 people. Mm. And, um, and that includes all of our iOS developers and designers. It includes all of our Android developers and designers. It includes all of our desktop developers and designers and our web developers and designers. Um, and that team of 20 does all the product work. Um, and uh, then customer service supports our customers and ops sort of supports the company in terms of infrastructure. And then uh, and that's sort of how the company is currently set up. So uh, I think each time people are separated as well. So we have like three people that are like one designer, one programmer, uh, and someone else working uh, together in a small team on one product. So because, so it's easier remotely to kind of collaborate. Is it what you do? Yeah, so, so product team. So we have like 20 people in the, who work on product. Um, in total, but the teams that we have are broken down to basically one designer and one or two programmers per feature that we're working on, so for, per part of the product that we're working on. So for example, um, we, were, we just are finishing up uh, adding templates to Basecamp. Templates was a big batch project. It took the full time, times uh, six weeks. It's actually taking a little bit longer than that. Um, there was one designer and two programmers on that feature, okay? Um, we're just A-B testing a variety of changes to our um, sign-up pages. That's actually just one designer. And also he's doing the development work as well. We're doing some stuff inside the app on A-B changes on, on the way people pay. That's one programmer and one designer. So teams are rarely ever bigger than three. Often mm -hmm. they're two, sometimes they're just one. Um, but, but sorry, but that, that's it. So. Um, if, if something is going to take more than three, three people to work on, we have to be, it actually does, does, doesn't really happen here. It, it just, three, three is the limit. And we've done this intentionally. You've had bigger teams in the past. And we find that three is enough. It also forces you to, um, first of all, another thing that's nice about three, it removes a lot of miscommunication problems. The moment you have more than three people, communication begins to be much harder. You often have to have a translator. It's harder to synchronize people's schedules, to get on a call together. Everything just gets harder. And what's really nice about three is it forces you into making sure that whatever you're about to do, you understand very clearly, you've defined very, very clearly, um, and you've made the scope tight enough that three people can finish this, this project in six weeks max. Mm -hmm. And it's a very good discipline to have. Good, really yeah. good. Seems uh, very efficient, very good. Very impressive people were just somebody was um commenting in the chat like it's very impressive how you can do so much within the end it's like a small team and then you can see like 50 people for some people it's a small company but at the same time right. it's such a big company you can do so much more than you know and they've kind of been accomplishing so much it's very impressive like how yeah, you, you know, get things done part of the reason why is because we actually have fewer people and, and really, I, I've seen this happen. We, we've, you know, as you add more people, you don't speed things up. You actually end up slowing things down. And mm. a team of, I believe a team of three is, it can move faster and get as much work done as a team of four. Because once you begin adding four or five, you actually end up adding overhead and there's more miscommunication. You have to work slower and you have to define things in, in a broader way. And I just think a team of three is, is better than a team of four. Um, now that doesn't mean sometimes that like when we have a team of three, when there's one designer, that designer might ask other designers in the company for their feedback or opinions on things. Right. So you can still like go outside the team and ask other questions of other people, but the actual people doing the work is, is three people. Good. Right. Well, cool. I'd like to actually go ahead and start asking, looking at a question that the audience has been asking since we have a lot of questions coming in. It's been very busy on the chat, um, the Q&A section. So let's go ahead sure. and start, see what questions people are. Awesome. So I'd like to start with TJ, uh, who's asking here, I know you're being a, a big proponent of remote work. What tips do you have for workers, especially developers, who want to land a job, a remote job? So what makes remote candidate appealing 
and what should candidates look for in a remote company? Great question. So, so to, to, this is all about increasing your odds of success, in my opinion. And I think, as I sort of mentioned earlier, if there's a company of 40 people and they all work locally and, and um, you want to be their first remote employee, I would stay away from that company. Mm-hmm. Just because the odds of success are very low. Um, you're going to be a guinea pig in many ways. People aren't going to know how to work with you. The culture is very much a local culture. So I would look to, if you're, if you're looking to join a company remotely, I would look for a very remote friendly company, one that's already very experienced in working remotely or a very, very small company. Um, but I would, I would be careful about joining a larger company and I don't even mean that large, but 20 or 30 or whatever, when everyone else is local, I think that you're just setting yourself up for a bad experience. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is I do think that remote employees, when you work remotely, you need to be comfortable sort of getting your human stimulation elsewhere in a sense. So if you've never worked remotely before and you've only worked in offices before, and you really thrive on sort of the extroverted, well, and you're extroverted or you really thrive on being around teammates, like that's gonna be a hard transition for you as well. So I'd make sure that you just know yourself, like make sure you know who you are and what you need um, from yourself and from others. Just being honest about that is I think a really, really important thing to do. Otherwise you can find yourself in a situation where you're just not being true to yourself and it's not gonna work either. Um, I think that one of the things I've looked for, I look for in remote employees, is people who are really self-motivated and very organized. Um, Being remote does require a little bit more self-motivation, organization, self-drive, a good sense of self. Like You just need a little bit more because you don't have the natural edges and boundaries of being around other people who who you might be able to sort of fit in with or follow along with. You just have less of that. So I think, I think that's really important too. Self-motivation, cool. Yeah. Thank you, and let's go for another one from Ludwig, who is asking, um, just let's make the right one here. So regarding staff contracts, how does Basecamp handle employees outside of the US? So one, are they freelancing? Two, did you guys create a subsidiaries in your biggest hub around the world? and have them signed a proper employment contract in their country of residence, or three, are they somehow tied to US expat or so? So if you can maybe reread, I think you can read the question yourself if there's yep. three sections. Um, so basically, how yep. do you handle employees outside of the US? Yep, so they are, uh, they, we, we've, we've explored a variety of ways to do this, and currently the way, the way it works is they, are, they all set up their own entity which is basically their own company. And then we hire their company. So hiring them essentially through, through their own company that they've set up in, in different, different uh, countries. I would encourage anyone who wants to do it this way to make sure they talk to accountants and lawyers and people who, you know, cause I can't, mm-hmm. I can't give account, uh, accounting and legal advice. Of course, I'm not a lawyer. So I would make sure that you, you look into this and you understand the implications for taxes and all, all those other things. But um, outside of the U.S., people set up their own entities and we hire those entities. Um, we don't create subsidiaries and we don't um, have, have offices that are owned by the company in, in other locations. Good. Thank you. Another one is from Alan. Alan is asking, any tips for mixed team? I'm working remote. In this kind of team, most of my colleagues are working from the office, and I'd like to hear some tips, tips on how to collaborate better with them and how to make it not being an effort for the others because I'm in my, of my remote status. So that's a great question. I know a lot of people are, are in this situation. Um, I can tell you how we do it, and that's all. I, it's hard for me to, because I, I don't really, it's hard for me to answer that question given the fact that I don't know the other people you're working with and how they work. but regardless of whether or not people are local or remote, we all work the exact same way. Um, which is that we have a, you know, we, we work, we work through base camp, even if I'm sitting next to someone in, in the office. Um, so I think what the problem is, is that when there's, if, if your teammates are all working one way and they, and then you have to work with them a different way, or they have to work with you a different way, it's just going to be hard. And sometimes I think it's worth admitting that like, that might not be a very good situation. 
it just might not be a good setup. Um, just because they're just natural tendencies that human, natural human tendencies. If four people are sitting around the desk to, together or table together, or they can eat lunch mm -hmm. together and you're the one outsider who isn't, there are going to be natural differences between how those people work and you're going to feel a little bit left out. Um, so I think the thing, you, the, the best way to make this work is to come up is to try to come up with a way where everyone is working the same way, regardless of whether or not they're local or remote. Um, but that's going to require those people to make big changes to their workflow probably. And that's just going to be hard. And sometimes, you know, I know everyone wants to hear good news and good answers uh, or good news, I should say. But sometimes the truth is that like, it's actually just really, really, really hard to change people and the way people work and being, you know, one of five who's remote or one of four that's remote is just extra difficult. And it's going to actually be on you and not on them. You're going to have to change there. It's very hard to get out three other people to change. Since you're the outsider, you're going to have to change. So I would encourage you to ask them, what can I do to be more useful, um, to be more helpful, um, to fit in better with the way you guys work versus, Hey, you guys change the way you work. So it'll benefit me. I, I think whenever, whenever you're sort of the outsider, you have to kind of conform in a sense. So, um, that's the, I know it's not like, Oh, awesome. This is going to be great tomorrow advice, but it's sort of the, the best advice I can give you, which is figure out how you can fit in with them versus they fit in with you. Mm -hmm. And it's also like kind of enabling the best processes that, you know, enables remote work, but also like for me, I mean, in my opinion about this is that if you want this to work, yeah, you need to have like processes that are the same within the company and outside of the company. So, but also comes from the value that the company itself, if the founder or the CEO is not at all somebody who's remote and he's kind of making you a, you know, being nice to you so you can work remotely might not be as, as you know, open That's to true. help you work remotely. Like a good example, like I'm actually, I'm in California today. I normally live in Chicago. I've been in California for three weeks now on vacation, work vacation, whatever. A um, little bit of a little bit of both. David, my business partner, lives in Spain half the year. Um, so we are like the people at the top of the business are also remote, and and I think that that really helps. I just think it helps communicate the fact that we really respect this kind of work, and, and versus it being like a, a sideshow where yeah, we have a few remote people. That's just, it's going to be really hard to, to make that work. So um, I, I do think it's important. And again, it doesn't, you don't actually have to physically, you don't actually have to physically be in a separate, like thousands of miles away. You can just work from home. Working from home is remote, even if you're local. And at our office in Chicago, we have 14 people who do live in Chicago and work out of our office, but they're only in the office two days a week, roughly. Most people work from home three days a week. And so any day you go in the office, there might be only four or five people there. So we have a remote culture, even though we're local. I think that's a very important step as well. Cool. Um, there's a question that um, I kind of uh, click into what's an insert um, by mistake. So I'm going to ask it right now. It's from Sir J. You might not be able to see it yourself. Um, okay. So it's the question is, are you still using a hybrid approach when developing mobile applications? Is it still worth it? And you, um, is it still worth it? And you apply it for a new streams page or are you gently shifting to native? So basically, are you doing still like um, web apps as well as mobile apps or native apps? Yep. So we, um, we our, our apps are still very much hybrid. And this, this allows us to make extraordinary progress um, with a very small team. Our iOS team is three people. Our Android team is three people. And um, that's it. Um, and the way we work is um, we, and by the way, we just completely redesigned the Basecamp 3 iOS app in about six weeks from scratch, like completely essentially with, again, a team of three people. Um, and um, the way we do this is that every screen that we make in Basecamp on the desktop, there's a really well done mobile web version of that screen that is available that, that, that the mobile team can access can, can pull into their into their app immediately and, and ship basically and then they can decide which screens inside the native apps they want to level up on a native basis so like some screens for example the list of projects uh and if you, if you open up the basecamp ios basecamp 3 ios app you're going to get these cards of all the projects that's actually rendered natively because speed is really important there but if you actually look at a message 
or a to do that's a native that's actually a web view um, because it doesn't have there's no advantage to making that a native view the advantage actually is that it, it is a web view and that we can iterate and change that live without having to ship a new version of, of the app to the app store which is less of an issue on on android where things are basically released instantly but uh, you know as everyone knows on, on the ios store it's just a little bit more of a hassle so what we do is we look at each screen independently and go does this need to be leveled up if it does not need to be leveled up just make it a web view and it can ship instantly and that the web views by the way are the responsibility i'm sorry the mobile web views are the responsibility of the of the web team they're not the responsibility of the native team the native team's responsibility is nativizing the screens that they see fit otherwise they don't have to and this allows us this is another really important thing this allows us to move um independently of one another so this is a very subtle thing but extremely important I don't want anyone at our company to be waiting on any other group of people for something. Okay. So if, if we had to, if we launched a feature on the web in the web version and we wanted that feature on iOS as well, and we had to wait for iOS to build a native version of that before we could ship the web version of it. Cause we wanted feature parity on both platforms. We would constantly be waiting for each other and that slows everything down and it creates a lot of bottlenecks. We want everyone to be able to slide past each other. So, when we ship something on, on, the, on, on the web side, it automatically exists on the native side as a web view in the, web, in the native apps. And then, so that ships instantly at the same time the web view does, but then the native team can decide three weeks later, four weeks later, four months later, or never to level that up. So they can improve it on their own schedule and not on the web schedule. This is a very important distinction. Um, this idea of being able to slide past each other and not create dependencies within an organization. Organizations that have too many dependencies move very, very slowly, and everyone's always waiting on each other. And that just grinds things to a halt, and that's, how, that's why a lot of companies run slowly is because they're always waiting on each other. All right. Well, thank you. Actually, this is the only time we got for the questions that went really fast. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was kind of giving you long answers. Sorry about that. No, but at the same time, I think it was all very valuable answers um, for – if there was any question I haven't been asked, but maybe later we can look at how we can answer to all the questions that people can have been I, can asking. Can I answer one really quick? One really quick yes. that I see here? The, the remote salaries at the top here? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we pay everyone the same salary. I mean, not everyone has different salaries, but it doesn't matter where you live. So we standardize our salaries basically on the Chicago area, um, which is a major market in the U.S. So it doesn't matter if you live in, you know, somewhere in Spain or you live in Tennessee or you live in Chicago or you live in the Bay Area or you live in Canada and in Toronto, wherever it is. Everyone gets paid on the same basis. So we don't, we don't, because I don't want to change someone's salary if they move. If someone mm -hmm. moves cities, they shouldn't get a pay cut, even though it might not be, but it would feel like one. So everyone gets, gets paid based on Chicago rates. Good. That's a good, uh, good thing. Awesome. I guess you don't, right, you don't have the, the Brexit. Uh, <laughs> this is what happened with UK. That's right. Tampere That's right. Different. <laughs> That's a good thing. Totally. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, for, for your time answering all these questions. That's very valuable, valuable information. And yeah. I hope we can see you again soon. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, turn off the session. Thank you very much, Jason. And I'm going to go ahead and change for Tom Stock from Human Wave. All right. Thank, thank you, you so Jason. Much. Bye now. Bye.